It's about that midnight cry. And Amen. the Bible, in fact, closes with a mention of that in the next to last verse, but it's not just one mention of it here in the last chapter of the Bible. There's no less than four mentions of the Lord's coming. Amen. And that sense of urgency that accompanies uh, the gospel, uh, the work of the church, as we anticipate uh, the Lord's coming. So thank you so much for setting that up, uh, brother, and, and uh, such a, a powerful way. Uh, the Lord's given you a great, great voice, and uh, I know it's a blessing to me to hear you this morning. I know it's a blessing to this church. I know uh, this church is also blessed with a fine pastor. I tell you, I'm so thankful to uh, be with uh, Brother Benny and thankful for the work that the Lord has, has used him and you to do here over the years uh, that uh, he's been your pastor, and I know it's a privilege for him to be your pastor, but also a privilege uh, for you to have him as a pastor. Brother Benny is about like family to me, to be honest with you. Uh, almost his family. He, uh, he's a, a father-in-law to my wife's first cousin, and so, uh, you know, being from this part of the country, we all just sort of mesh together there at some point, and, and uh, he's uh, always been uh, close to not only my family, but close to my heart as I've seen the way he's lived his life with integrity before the Lord, uh, the way he sought to serve the Lord's church and the Lord's people. And for the invitation to be here with you this week, uh, Pastor, I'm grateful and uh, thankful that uh, we will be able to share in this time, look forward to what uh, God is going to do. Let me say also, uh, I'm thankful for this church and and all that you're doing, not just in this community, though I'm thankful for what you're doing in this community where, where you're desperately needed. But I'm thankful for what you're doing beyond this community. And uh, just, just to have a church like this that gives so faithfully through the missions offerings like Eliza brought us, but also through the cooperative program where, uh, where you're taking the gospel all across the state, uh, all across this nation, and in fact, literally around the world. I'm going to be sharing with you a little bit of highlights about that this week. I won't take much time to do it this morning, uh, but uh, just to give you snippets here and there, and let me say that uh, as one of the snippets uh, to remind you of today, that, that you are paying the salaries of more than 4,000 missionaries who are sharing the gospel all around this globe. Uh, they are taking the good news to places where the good news would not be heard if they weren't there. But through your faithful and sacrificial giving, you're providing for the gospel to go to the very ends of the earth. And I want to say thank you for that. Keep doing the good work that you're doing. The Bible's last words. How does the Bible close? Revelation 22, verses 20 and 21. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And amen. As we think about the closing words of the Bible and the focus of those words, knowing that it really is focusing on the second coming of the Lord. It, it, it occurs to me as, as I reflect upon the preaching and teaching that I hear uh, oftentimes in these days, traveling across the state or in other places, uh, I don't think I hear as much teaching and preaching on the second coming of Christ, Brother Benny, as I once did. I, I know as a boy growing up, First Baptist Jellico, whether it was a visiting preacher like R.G. Lee or uh, the pastor who baptized me, Alan Herod, or, uh, or others, uh, not just in that church, but in the churches around, it seems to me that uh, uh, during those days, I heard a lot more emphasis placed upon the second coming of Christ. Amen. There seemed to be a, 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 a greater anticipation of it, an awareness of it, a, 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 maybe a longing for it. But it occurs to me that the attitude has sort of changed in our day, even with church-going people, that uh, the attitude when we think about Jesus coming again is, is something like this. Oh, He's coming. Yeah, I, well, I believe that. Uh, but does it have to be today? <laughs> uh, Christ is coming again. Well, I'm, I'm for that. I'm not against it. But, but does it have to be now? I, I, I mean, 
the thoughts that often go through our minds is uh, something like this. You know, there was, there was a little more living I wanted to do. There was some uh, more places I wanted to go, some more things I wanted to see, some more experiences I wanted to have in life. And so I think that'd be great if Jesus came again. I'm just not sure I'd want him to come right now. But when I think about that attitude, I also think about the image that the Bible gives us to help us understand uh, the church, what the church of the Lord Jesus is. You know, one of the images that the Bible uses to help us understand the church is that of a bride. Amen. That, that, that Amen. the church is the bride of Christ, Amen. and Christ is her groom. And in fact, the Bible talks about the day when the Lord comes as, as, a, as a wedding day, a time when the bride and groom will be united. Just a couple of chapters back uh, in uh, Revelation, we find that sort of language that is, that is uh, communicated. If, you, if you're familiar with the book of Revelation, then you know that a lot of what we read in the book of Revelation is, is a record of, of a vision or a series of visions that the Lord gave His servant John. And the Lord helps John understand some of the things that are taking place in his day by giving him this vision. Of course, John's sitting in prison. But the Lord is revealing things to him through the vision. The Lord's helping John understand some things that were soon going to take place in his day. Some things that are taking place in our day, I think, are, are, are described in the vision, in the book of Revelation. Some things that have yet to take place, even now. But a part of that vision, back up with me a couple of chapters, Revelation 19. And a part of that vision, we, we hear described a, a wedding. Revelation 19, beginning in verse 6. John says that at this point in the vision, he says, I heard, as it were, the voice of a, a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory. Listen to this. For the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife, remember the bride of Christ is what? The church. His wife, the bride, the church has made herself ready. What she's ready for? She's, she's ready for a wedding day. Verse 8, it, to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the th fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. He said to me, these are the true sayings of God. This is a, this is a celebration. It's a wedding. Celebration. You know, weddings are times to celebrate, aren't they? Amen. Uh, I, I enjoyed looking at the wedding announcement in the bulletin. Uh, I imagine, uh, Pastor, you've been here 24 years. You've probably done a few weddings uh, here at Faith. Anybody been married at, at Faith Baptist? Yeah, there several hands going up. What if you had the wedding here in the church? I'm such a beautiful sanctuary and such a beautiful facility. The uh, the Lord has given you, and you've worked hard to uh, provide and take care of. I, I imagine if you had a wedding here, you wouldn't have to do too much decorating. Uh, just a beautiful sanctuary. You'd probably, probably move the pulpit out, maybe move the communion table out. Well, just, just imagine with me, it's, it's wedding day here at Faith Baptist, and, and we won't name a bride and groom, but you just think about what it might be like if, if, if the wedding ceremony was, was beginning, and, and so you, you've got the wedding party up here already, and and Pastor uh, Benny's up here, and the groom's standing down there at the altar. And, and I imagine over here, the flower girl and the maid of honor, and those uh, pretty bridesmaids, they probably, I don't know, maybe sprinkled out through here or down the steps or down on the floor. And, and over on this side, of course, you've got the best man, and you've got the groomsman, and you've got that little ring bear fella. I don't know how you handle that fella, uh, Pastor, but let me tell you how I handle that fella. I give very specific instructions to the best man about that little fella. And here are my instructions, best man. You hold on to that boy. <laughs> I mean, you put one hand on one shoulder, the other hand on the other, and don't you let go until this thing's over. <laughs> uh, you never know what those little fellas are going to do. I, I've, I've, seen, I've seen them try about everything. In fact, I saw one wedding, uh, and, and just right at a middle of ceremony, that little fella broke loose, and and, and, and he went down and he, he began to turn summer salt flip-flops all the way across the, the front of the sanctuary. And, 
And uh, I was glad the bride had a sense of humor because that, that might not have gone well with some brides. But uh, So I just, just to kind of keep things in order, I tell that best man, you, this boy is your responsibility. You, you hold on to him. But, uh, you, you, you know that part of the ceremony when everybody's up here and, except the bride and, and the piano begins to play. A, is it Canon D? Is that, is that what? I, I don't know anything about music, but I asked somebody one time. I think they said Canon D. That, that's the song. You know it when you hear it. That's where, that the bride enters on, you know. And so so that, that song has began to play, and we, out of honor of the bride, we're all standing at that point, and we look back, and, and those uh, double doors are open, and, and, and we're, we're seeing there she is uh, in her beautiful wedding gown, and she's under her father's arm, and, and she's about to walk down that aisle. But, but we notice something strange is happening. Because she's, she's not moving. Instead, it seems that she she's struck up a conversation with her daddy right there while we're all waiting. And we can't hear what she's saying, but if we could, here's what it'd be. Now, Daddy, you know I want to get married. I'm just not sure I want to get married today. Daddy, do you mind to go in and thank everybody for coming and and tell them we're going to have a wedding. We're, we're, just, we're just not going to have it today. Now, I tell you, I'd feel mighty sorry for that old boy down at the front, wouldn't you? I mean, what's going on there? At best, there's a young woman who's just not ready to get married. But it may be worse than that. It may be that she's backing out of this whole thing because another lover has stolen her heart. When the Bible talks about the church being the bride of Christ, and yet we think about the attitude that seems so pervasive uh, among even uh, church folk today when we think about the, the groom coming for his bride, when we think about the wedding day of the church and that attitude being something like, well, you know, I, yeah, I mean, that'd be great. I'm just not sure I want it to happen right now. I'm not sure I want it to happen today. Yeah, I, I, I think the real problem is that, that another lover has stolen our heart. That we've set our affections on the things of this world more so than the one who created the world. More so than the one who has so much more for us than this world has to offer. But we, we've fallen in love with what we see here and miss the greater love of the Savior. I dare say if that's the attitude of the church, then, then the church probably isn't ready for the Lord to come. That's, that's the case for anybody, that they're not ready for the Lord to come. Brothers and sisters, that, that, that's, that's a dangerous place to be. That's a dangerous place to be. In fact, I, I, I think in our own hearts, we need to remedy that. We need to make sure we're ready, that we're prepared for the Lord's coming. And if we had known anybody, friend or stranger, family member or an enemy who isn't ready, who isn't prepared, I, I, I think we ought to take it upon ourselves to make sure they have the opportunity to get ready, to be prepared. Why is that? Well, because what we're reading here in Revelation 22 teaches us that His coming is imminent. Amen. His Amen. coming, that is to say, He's coming soon. Amen. In fact, I, as I already mentioned, there are four references. Let's see what they are. Back up with me the beginning of the chapter, nearly the beginning, in verse 7. That's the first reference to Jesus coming soon. Jesus is speaking in the, vision of jo in the vision to John, and here's what He says. Behold, I am coming quickly. Amen. Blessed is He who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. That's the first reference. The second, just down a few verses, in ver is in verse 10. Look at verse 10. Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. It's coming soon. That's the second reference. The third reference to the soon coming of Christ is in verse 12. Look with me at verse 12. Jesus is speaking again in the vision to John. He says, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to His work. There's three times we find it emphasized that Christ's return is imminent. But there's a fourth. We've already read it. It's down in verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Quickly, Friends, is it a mere coincidence that four times in the final chapter 
of the final book of the Bible, we find it stressed that Jesus is coming soon. I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that's entirely upon purpose. I think that's the way God wanted to close His book. By giving us the warning that time will not always transpire as it's transpiring. Things will not always go on as they're going on. No, a great and final end is coming to this world. Jesus is coming soon. Now one of the reasons I believe that we have become... uh, sort of lackadaisical and, and, and not really thinking much about this is because, honestly, it's been a long time since this book was written. I mean, you think about that sense of urgency that closes the book, but it's been 2,000 years since the book was penned by the Spirit of God speaking to John. What are we to make of that? This sense of urgency, and yet 2,000 years have gone by. Well, I think there's a clue Uh, to this in the chapter. In fact, I I think you find it in verse 11. Now verse 11, let me warn you, it's a strange sounding verse, at least at the beginning. In fact, it doesn't sound much like Bible at all when you first start reading verse 11. Why do I say that? Well, listen to it. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy or sinful, let him be filthy or, or sinful Still, now that doesn't sound much like Bible, does it? If you're, if you're unjust, if you're not right with God, if you're, if you're filthy, you're still in your sin, you just keep right on being unjust, you just keep right on being wrong with God, you just keep right on in your filthy and sinful way. That doesn't sound much like Bible. You know, when, when Jonah came and preached to the Ninevites, you remember what Jonah said? He said, you sorry Ninevites, you just keep on being sorry Ninevites. No, that's not what he said. He called them to repentance. He warned them of the coming judgment of God and called them to turn from their wickedness. The Bible says when Peter preached at Pentecost, he preached not keep on doing what you're doing. The Bible says when he preached, they were pricked to the heart and They cried out, what must we do to be saved? And what did Peter say? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins. The the Bible issues a call to turn from our sin and turn to the Savior. uh, to, to, To put our trust in Jesus and have our lives transformed. And then begin following Him as our Lord and to live a different life. But now verse 11 doesn't seem to be saying that. If you're unjust, keep being unjust. If you're filthy, keep being filthy. Now it sounds a little better at the end of the verse when it says, He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. But, But what are we to make of this? You just keep on sinning. Message of verse 11. Well, remember the context. What's this chapter about? This chapter is about the day that the Lord is coming back. And here's the message. On that day, it's going to be too late. On that day, if you're still lost in your sin, you just go right on being lost in your sin because you're going to be lost in your sin for eternity. When when the clouds roll back as a scroll and the Savior comes again, it will be too late at that point for you to bow your head and whisper a prayer, Jesus, save me. The opportunity will have passed. What Revelation 22 presents to us is the sense of urgency that must accompany the preaching of the gospel. The sense of urgency that must uh, overtake us when we hear the good news that Jesus saves, but the bad news that we're sinners and we need a Savior. That that there is no time to waste. His coming is imminent. He's coming soon and we better make ready before He comes. Because if we don't, we won't be able to be ready. And so friend, if you're here this morning and you've not yet given your life to Christ, the message is a very clear and urgent message. You need to make that right today. You need to give your life to Christ now. He may come back today and then it'll be too late. But even if He doesn't come back today, you may face Him today. 
Thousands are killed on the roadways every day. Did you walk to church? I mean, the point is, there are no guarantees in this life. Zero guarantees that you have another breath to draw. Why would you put off the most important decision in all of eternity? His return is imminent. But there's another thing that's emphasized here in Revelation 22. And it's that His return is exclusive. His return is exclusive. What, what I mean by that? Well, let me, let me put this in good old uh, uh, Jellicoe English. <laughs> he ain't coming back for everybody. <laughs> okay? He's, he's, he's not. He's not coming back for everybody. We find that communicated subtly, I think, in verse 7. Behold, I am coming quickly. He doesn't go on to say, blessed is everybody on that day. No, it says, blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. The day of Christ's return will be a great blessing to those who have believed the book and who have received the Savior who is testified to in the book. But those who have it, it's not going to be a good day for them. Verse 12, he says, my reward or recompense is with me to give to everyone according to his work. There's going to be a day of judgment, a day of accountability on that day. And those who know Christ will be rewarded with the kingdom of heaven. But those who have rejected him, who have turned him away, who have refused to receive him and give him their lives, their reward will be much different. Much different we were in South Africa earlier this summer uh, on a mission trip visiting with some of your missionaries had the opportunity to do some work there Uh, you probably want to know about that work Uh, we were in uh, a community uh, where there's a ministry center there that has been built by Kentucky Baptists and at this ministry center People can come and get food. Uh, Not just anybody can come. This ministry center gives out a weekly ration of dried food to children. And the reason they give out that weekly ration of dried food to children is that these are children without parents. Uh, What we have here are kids whose mommies and daddies have died uh, from AIDS. AIDS is a plague on South Africa. So many lives have been lost. The condition of these children is such that there's there's nobody to take care of these children when their mommies and daddies die. And so taking care of the children has fallen to the oldest child. We we call these child-headed households. Typically there are about four or five kids in in these uh, families and, and the oldest kid is somewhere between 12 and 14 years of age on average. And, and they're raising, the oldest one is raising the rest of them. And there's one thing that stands between those children and starving to death. That's the generation, or the generosity of churches like this church who have given through the cooperative program and that money is used to buy food to keep these children from starving to death. And they can come every week and get that food. They also have the opportunity to hear Bible stories and and to hear the gospel. Uh, We spent about three weeks gone from the country. And I'll tell you what, by the time we got home, we had a good trip. But I was glad to be home. (laughs) Uh, We landed in Louisville Airport and made our way up through the security check station there. If you're familiar with the way the airports work, you know, if you come to pick somebody up, you can only go back so far. Uh, but uh, we went up through that security checkpoint, and there there's a large crowd of people that welcome us home. And there was a lot of those folk I knew and had loved and appreciated, but, but honestly, I was pretty rude to them. Uh, I, uh, I just walked right by about all of them. Well, why was I so rude? Well, I'd already seen this curly-headed blonde standing in the back. And... Uh, She was the one I'd been missing and the one I was coming home to see. I've been, we've been together since we were 14. Now, we're from Jellicoe, but we didn't marry at 14, okay? <laughs> Both of our grandmothers married at 14, literally. The, my, my grandmother, uh, who's uh, near the end of her life, uh, who helped raise me, uh, 
Uh, she, she married at 14. And yet, uh, Michelle and I made uh, not married at 14, but we've been together a long, long time. And oh, that, that's who I was coming home to see. I was coming home to see my bride and, and my children. The Bible says Jesus is coming. He's not coming for everybody. He's coming for His bride. He's coming for the church, for those who belong to Him, His adopted sons and daughters. And for those of us who are His, His day, the day of His coming, it's going to be a great day. An eternal, wonderful celebration is going to begin on that day. It's going to be beautiful forever. But for those who aren't His, now it's going to be an eternally dreadful day. Because you think about it, if you've refused the Lord on this earth, then the Bible says you're going to be separated from Him forever. What does that mean? Well, well, think of it in these terms. The Bible says God is love. Now, if you're separated from love and the source of any love in your life for all eternity, what do you have left? The hatred of hell. The Bible says the Spirit of God is our comforter. Now, if you're separated from from your comforter and the source of any comfort in your life, what do you have left? The sorrow and the grieving of hell. Amen. The Bible says Christ is our joy. Amen. Now if I were to take away your joy and your source of joy and you had no joy left in your life, what would you have left? The anguish and the misery. The Bible says Jesus is your life. Now take away life. And the source of life, what remains? The eternal death of hell. I don't want that, do you? I, I, I don't want that for my kids. I don't want that for my friends, my neighbors. I, I wouldn't want that for a stranger even an enemy. Do you want it for yourself? Would you want that for your grandkids, for your, your, your children, for your parents? You think about those in your life who are without Christ. Think about your own life. Do you know Christ? See, the need to prepare for His coming is a very urgent in fact, I'd say this, there's no greater need in your life. Amen. There's no greater need in anyone's life Amen. than that they prepare for the coming of Christ. Because His return is imminent and it's exclusive. But we don't just need to prepare for it. The last thing I want to point out here is that John teaches us to pray for it. That, that it's, it's something good that we should be praying for, longing for, looking forward to. Why do I say that? Well, notice uh, back in verse 20, how John responds now that he's heard this fourfold refrain that Jesus is coming soon. How does John respond? John, after we read, surely I'm coming quickly, Jesus says, John responds by saying, Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. John hears Jesus say, I'm coming soon. He says, Amen. What, what, what's that mean? Well, it's a good Baptist word, isn't it? John must have been a Baptist. <laughs> He heard something he liked. He said, Amen. That's actually not an English word. It's a Greek word. Uh, the word is Amen in the Greek. We, we haven't translated this word. We, we just brought it into the English language. The, the, the technical term, we transliterate it. We brought it into our language. And, but what it means, if you were to give a, 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 a good interpretation or translation of it, is, is it means let it be or let it happen or or let it become. It's, it's a way of agreeing. You hear something you like, you say, yeah, let that come to pass. I'm for, I'm for it. You hear uh, Pastor Benny preaching, and he makes a strong point you agree with. You, Amen. I'm for it. John hears Jesus say, I'm coming soon. John doesn't say, well, Lord, I guess that'd be great, but it does have to be today. No, that's not John's attitude. John's attitude is, really? really? I, mean, I mean, the shackles that have cut... Uh, to the bone on my wrists and my ankles. Lord, you, 
I'd be free from them today. Lord, the, the, the stench of death in this prison cell, Lord, you, you'd lift me to this and to your eternal glory. Lord, you, you, you're you coming. You mean you're coming soon? Could, could it be today? Yes, Lord, I'm for it. Amen. You mean my brothers and sisters throughout the Roman Empire who are being persecuted, who are uh, being imprisoned like I've been, who, who are being crucified and beheaded. Lord, you, you'd come to rescue your church from this. Amen. Our brothers and sisters who are being treated throughout the world no differently than John and his brothers and sisters are being treated. I promise you if they were to have the thought right now, the Lord is coming, He's coming soon, the immediate reaction would be, Amen, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Our brothers and sisters in Nigeria where it is night now who are finding themselves unable to sleep and and their tears have drenched their pillow for another night. Why? They're praying for their daughters. Their daughters who by the hundreds were captured, stolen from their Christian school. And they've fallen into the hands of the Muslim terrorists. The little 8, 9, 10, 11 year old baby girls. Can you imagine the horrors? We don't want to imagine the horrors. Could you imagine what it would be like to be their mommy, their daddy, worrying moment by moment, day after day, what has become of my child? And to thank Jesus you'd come and rescue them today. Amen. Come quickly. Church, don't you see this is a good promise? John responds by saying, yes, Lord, come. He, he prays for it. When I was a boy growing up, uh, just a little fellow, in fact, I was two years old, when things sort of changed at our house, our mother left our home. I had a brother was one and a brother was four. And from that point on, our father raised us. And my mother had visitation rights. We'd see her on a weekend and sometimes for a week in the summer. And divorce has touched about all our families. I mean, you, you, you know what that looks like and, and what I'm talking about. Uh, I, I remember on those visits, some of the exchanges. You know what the exchange is? A, a, a place is planned to meet and the kids are handed from one parent to the other or a grandparent takes them to drop them off with another grandparent or what have you. I remember some of those exchanges, uh, they didn't go all that smoothly for us. Dad would have one boy wrapped around one leg, another around the other leg, another grabbing his waist. Dad, don't make us go. Please, can't we just stay home? Please let us stay home. Now, it wasn't that our mother mistreated us or anything like that. It's just that, uh, that home was home, and Dad was the one who, who was raising us and taking care of us. That's where we, where we liked it, and, and that's what we knew. And on top of that, you couldn't take your, your dirt bike, your BB gun. <laughs> Can't we just stay home? <laughs> I remember there was something Dad would always do that would kind of calm those moments down and get us through them. He's a tall man like, like myself. He'd always get down on our level. He'd, he'd kneel down. He'd line us up in front of him. And then he'd speak to us. And here's what he'd say. Now, boys, you go on with your mother. It's going to be okay. I'll be to get you. Now, you go on, boys, and do what, what you're supposed to do. It'll all be all right. I promise you. I'll be to get you. Now, Dad never lied to us, and we knew that about him. And so we, he made a promise. We, we knew he'd keep it. We knew he'd be to get us. And sure enough, he always was. And so that, 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 that changed those moments. We dried up, and we'd get in line, and we'd go do what we're supposed to do because we knew he'd keep his promise to come and get us. Father's given you a promise. He didn't send his son just one time. He sent him again. The Lord Jesus has given you a promise. He didn't humble himself and come just one time. He's coming again. Amen. And, and, and here's what he has to say to you today if you belong to him. You go on and do what I've asked you to do. It'll be okay. Because I'll be to get you. Amen. You go on. You take up your cross another day. I don't know what that looks like in your life. I don't know how heavy it is or how hard it is to carry right now. But you do. The Lord says, you take up your cross another day and you follow me. It'll be okay. I'll be to get you. He says, you, you keep on doing what I ask you to do. You keep on uh, sharing uh, 
with others, keep on sharing the gospel, keep on inviting them to church, inviting them to revival services. Now, it may be some of them turn and go the other way when they see you coming. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to say, you don't worry about that. You just do what the Lord's asked you to do. He'll take care of everything else. It's not your job to save them. It's just your, your job to share with them. Amen. So you go do it. It'll be okay. He'll be to get you. Amen. Don't you see this is a good promise? Amen. Amen. The Lord loves you. And he's coming for you. Amen. If you're his and if you're ready. If not, oh, don't let another moment pass. Amen. Come to Christ today. Because he's coming soon. Let's stand. Brother Meyer comes to lead us in a hymn of invitation. Your pastor's going to be here at the front. And here's the chance for you to be ready, for you, for you to make yourself, your heart ready by turning your heart over to Jesus and letting Him save you so that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're His. And if He comes today, He's coming for you. Now, it's a very simple process, really. It's just a matter of, of repenting of our sin and confessing it to the Lord and, and calling on His name, trusting Him as our Savior and our Lord. And, and if you're ready to do that, we, do, we want to celebrate that with you. And so Amen. as we sing, you just step right out and you come down and, and you tell the pastor that news and, and let us celebrate with you and welcome you into God's family. Maybe you have questions. Well, I'm not sure I know what to do. I'm not sure what that means. You, you come. Uh, Brother Benny can answer those questions. Let him. Maybe, maybe there's somebody on your heart today and you need to take them before the Lord. You need to come to this altar and, and pray for that lost family member or friend or neighbor, co-worker, and just ask that God one more time will give you the opportunity to share with them and that this time they'd, they'd hear you out, that they'd be saved. Uh, there's, there's plenty of room up here for you to bring that burden or other burdens to the Lord. However God is dealing with you, it's, it's not my invitation. It's not the invitation of faith, Baptist Church. It, this is the invitation of the Heavenly Father to you and His Son to respond to what He's done for you and what He wants to do in your life. So you come as we sing.